Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Jane. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for asking, Michael. Great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you for asking to be on. I'm always <laughs> delighted when people say, yeah, I want to be on that podcast, um, find out and share their story. And yeah, I, unfortunately, as you have experienced, I've had over the last six months or so, uh, and also this year has happened as well, quite a few people booking. I only do one interview a week. Um, and now... For anyone who's listening, I'm booked out through till July this year. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy good. That's crazy good. <laughs> it's 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 a nice problem to have, I guess, because I don't need to worry about finding guests every week. But yeah. I've, I suppose when I've started this podcast, I never really kind of panicked if I didn't get any guests for a couple of weeks or so. But now it's it's not an issue. The only thing I've had to do is make sure I block off some time in my calendar <laughs> for holidays and things. Yeah, you need to make sure that you don't burn out and just, you know, yeah. to, to get get a few in the can if you fancy taking a week off and then that's and true. Then, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's do true. it that way around. But I know when we booked, we booked um it must have been three or four months ago and I think you were like oh I'm really sorry it's like three or four months and I was like don't worry because I was overseas it was fine it worked perfectly for me so it's all very good. understanding that's good and the, and obviously other things happen in the story as well don't they during that period so <laughs> <laughs> well yeah you never know a lot can happen in four months <laughs> in this world at the moment yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah. So Jane, um, I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. Obviously, I've read bits and pieces, but it's always good to hear it uh, rather than read it. Um, So I'll start with my opening question. My guests are used to this question is, please tell us a little bit about you. Where were you born? Have you moved around? Uh, What about school, education? How did that go? Your first job, career? And then obviously how you got into what you're doing today. So I'm going to hand over to you and just sit here and listen and enjoy. Gosh, yes. How long have we got? (laughs) (laughs) Plenty of time. So so for um, anyone in the UK listening, I'm I'm a northern girl. So I come from Manchester originally. Um, I've lost a lot of my accent because I left there when I was um, 18 years of age. And I and I went to I left and went to uni and never went back Um, but just go back for for visits right now so that's that's where I'm from that's where my kind of heart is that's where my sort of values set anyone knows people from that uh, neck of the woods we're great people very friendly very outgoing Um, my husband now we we do go back and visit family and he's always surprised at how people talk to one another on public transport which in central London never happens that you don't even make eye contact with people so it's a it's a completely different culture up there which which I which I love Mm. In terms of my first job, my first job was actually delivering the weekly newspaper. So I used to deliver the Sale and Altering and Messenger. So I used to do my brother's round. So so at that I don't know what it is now, but in those days you couldn't have a job, a paper round until you were 13. Mm. And um, I was, I think, 11. Um, oh. My brother, my brother didn't want to do it because he was too busy, you know, playing lacrosse and ice hockey and all of this. So I said, okay, I'll do it obviously for the money and then I got my own round at 13 so that that kind of got me out of the house and started earning money from from a young age and I think that gave me a real sense of independence from a very very young age yeah I I I when I go walking the dog early in the morning like seven o'clock in the morning I often see paper girls and paper boys in all weathers I have to say and yeah. uh and in, in the you know very early morning in the dark uh as well i mean they must be up earlier than i'm walking the dog type of thing <laughs> and that's incredible at that age i think it's incredible that they're still yeah. doing it today yeah i know i don't know how many people still do that i mean the, the i never wanted to do that kind of paper round because it did mean every day getting up early and even then i wasn't a morning person so right 
doing it once a week and having that it was as long as it's delivered by six o'clock on a Friday <laughs> it was yes. I was almost hybrid working before hybrid working was a thing because I used to figure out when was the best time to go and do it and just trying I used to try and do it all in one go I could get it done in a couple of hours that was uh, that was good but yeah that was my mm-hmm. first job and then I I moved into um we didn't have a lot of money growing up so I never had pocket money and my mum was working as a, she was, she had like a little, you, nowadays you'd call it a side hustle. Right? Yeah. She had a side hustle being a waitress and she'd go and, and one day she couldn't find a babysitter for me. So she took me with her and I was sitting in the car and the person who was doing the dishes didn't arrive. So she said, my daughter will do it. So then I came and I was like, they didn't have oh, they did I gotta remember it to this day they didn't have a dishwashing machine so I was literally washing 70 of everything by hand without washing up gloves and then that was it it's like oh she's a good worker isn't she so that was it then I had another job <laughs> I had a side hustle to add oh. to my side hustle but that gave me a that gave me a real um love of hospitality so it was it was working at events so it was right. working in hospitality and that's what I went to do my degree in because I got to my kind of end of school and it was like what are you going to do now because my school expected you to go to university and I yes. was the black sheep because I went to a polytechnic good right how dare you and that's and I did I did um catering management and retail management as my degree which was ah. it was brilliant I mean it's just a the, the people in hospitality, are, if you ever want a good night out, go out with people in hospitality because they know how to party. <laughs> 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 they know how to get their house to party. And they're also well connected that, that you always have like great venues and things like that. Yes. So that, I mean, that, that, was my, that was my degree. And then at the end of my degree, it was like, right, what am I going to do now? And I was you know, really late in figuring out that I've got to go and get a proper job now. Yeah. And this, the year I left, this tells you how old I am, the year I left was the year that Disneyland Paris was opening. And they came right. to our uni. You know, I don't know if they still do this. They, do, they used to call it a milk round. So they go yes. to all the unis and all the, all the companies that show pony their, their wares and try and lure you in. And um, so I, I joined Euro, a Euro Disney, as it was called at the time, on their graduate training program in oh. their resorts, in their hospitality, in their hotels. So I was, my first job there was doing night shift, mise en place. It was the largest hotel in Europe at the time, had over a thousand bedrooms. And the mise en place for breakfast took seven hours. <laughs> so, wow. That was me in a blue boiler suit with some, guy, some German guy, some French guy. I just, it, it was just like the weirdest time, but it was a brilliant job. and. And I, le- I had oh, you to moved learn then French. To Paris. Yeah. yeah, I moved to Paris, age 21, moved to Paris. Wow. And I had the time of my life. I mean, just... Really? That was brave. Yeah. I mean, you didn't speak French before you went. I spoke a little bit. I did A-level right. French. And, oh, and I remember, okay. I remember sis- I got a D. Or did I get... No, I got an E. <laughs> <laughs> That's E for echo. That's E for extremely bad. Um, but I remember oh, excellent. In, the, yeah. <laughs> in the interview, there was this woman, she was English and she was trying to do the interview in French. And there was me and there was two very posh public school girls going, oh, yeah, we, you know, we go skiing every year in France. So, you know, we really speak French. Well, they were crap at French and I was better than the English person interviewing. And I was like, I actually speak more than I think I like more than I realize. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. because, you know, at the time where I was working, it was it was very like it was one of the most multicultural places I've ever worked because, you know, there was just people from every country imaginable. But on the night yeah. shift, it w- we had to speak French. It was like the yeah. only kind of common language between us all. So right. you know, three months of that and and my French got better. And I also made the made the point of not hanging around in this English bubble. Mm. not hanging around in this English expat bubble I did have English friends and American friends but I also had French friends so I would go to parties with the French people and some of my best friends now are French who I met in working in Disney so it it is open it just opens this world if you can speak another language 
And the best way, uh, as you've alluded to effectively, is go and work in the country where the language is spoken because yeah. you just absorb it so much faster that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was, I'm a Dutchman originally. I was, I was very good at English because of where my mother was from and she spoke English at home a lot. So I was very good at English in school. But when I came to the UK, I wasn't confident enough to go and continue yeah. my studies yeah. in English. I, I, I went, no, it's no way I've got that confidence. But then, of course, I started working straight away. And of course, you're in that country, in the country where the language is spoken. OK, it's English, but you learn it so much faster. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I do. I do believe, though, that you have to have a foundation so mm. as boring as it is, I don't know if it's the same in English, but as boring as it is in French, you have to go and learn yes. tenses. You have to learn yeah. verb conjugation because once you know that, then you learn the uh, you know, you learn new verbs and you can then conjugate them because you have to, because it just changes the meaning completely. It's like, you know, you were going or you want to go or you would like to go. It's all very different, it's all very yes. subtle. But if you yes. don't get that foundation in place, you can't build the house on top of it. So I say no. yes and get those basics. And don't be afraid to make mistakes because you will make yeah. mistakes. You're going to mess up. You're going to say things that are completely inappropriate, unwittingly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because there's, 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 there's a word, for, there's two words in French. It's coup, coup and cue. And one is neck and one is your backside. So very often... <laughs> I had a pain in my neck. I was telling people I had a pain in my neck. Like literally. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you will. And people would look at you like, you really? I was like, yes. And I point to my neck and they go, ah, oh, no. So I say, cool. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> so yeah, you will make mistakes. And it is just, you know, just go with it, but just use that as a learning thing. So now I know the real difference between neck and, you know, backside. The other part of your um, body. Yeah. The other part of your body. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, you've just got to, you've just got to do that. And, you know, and I, mm. and I went there and, and then, you know, the, at the time, anyone who remembers Disneyland, Euro Disney opening, it was a bit of a disaster because these, the, the Disney Corporation picked up this American thing and plonked it 32 yeah. kilometers east of Paris and culturally it just did not work so there's so many things that weren't working with it mm. and everybody involved in this graduate program I don't know they just disappeared whether they got fired or whether they left I still don't know to this day right. uh, but then all, then auditions came to go and join the parade because obviously this was one of the things which was like we need to like put on a show here was one of the like how we're going to turn this business around so for yeah. one year anniversary they put or they went and recruited all these people to go to the parade team so I I just thought well I've quite fancied that I'm quite a good dancer done a lot of show you know theater at school and stuff so I went and auditioned right. and got the job and that was like the best job ever suddenly my job is dancing down main street usa or being on the castle stage or doing the electric light parade or doing the beauty and the beast show as all these different characters and dancers and stuff yeah. and so i stuck there for another few years so i stayed in disney all in all about two and a half years and i left i left because i thought right okay people are starting to leave now my kind of cohort my my friendship right. group right. and I think it's one of those places you go and you just have an amazing time and leave or you're like a like long term you know one of my very best friends is still there and has been there for 30 years because this year wow. is the 30th anniversary which is scary right yeah <laughs> wow but it's uh, it was a great foundation especially I mean, it's great because you, the degree that you did and then going into kind of a hospitality, like the biggest name in the world. Yeah. That's pretty guest, amazing. The guest yeah. experience. I mean, if you, you know, the, there's things that I've taken further into my career that I learned at Disney. 
yeah and once you've got that as a foundation so certainly in terms of guest experience in terms of you know never saying no you do say no but never will use the word no <laughs> how you point <laughs> so i've got that face that people stop in the street and ask directions and you never point with one finger you always do the two finger point it's just over there uh... <laughs> all these little things that you know that never leaves you <laughs> never leaves you you know you walk down the street and you pick up a bit of rubbish and put it in a bin you know you're never more than um i can't remember like 10 meters from a trash can in disney yeah yeah so you know yeah. it's everybody's responsibility to pick up the rubbish and yes. you know put it in yeah. the bin doesn't matter who you are yeah. no oh great so two and a half years there back to the uk back to the uk and then i thought right i've got to get a proper job now so um at the time i was living with um my boyfriend on the isle of wight and um, which is an island just off sort of Ports near portsmouth southampton not a lot happens on the isle of wight and um, mm. not a lot of opportunities beautiful place but yeah. it's not the place where you want to be as a 20 something year old who's just got back from spending two and a half years <laughs> in Paris so I was actually on the the ferry going to an interview on the mainland as they call the UK and I picked up the newspaper and I saw an advert to go and be a holiday rep and I was like oh this sounds really fun so I went yeah I, I sent my um I sent my application off and then I find myself in Mallorca a couple of months later being a holiday rep at <laughs> So, well, I was, I was actually off to my training, and then I went to be a holiday rep for it. And I did. I ended up doing three seasons. So I did the summer season in Mallorca, I did a ski season in Andorra, and then I did a second season in Mallorca in a different resort. Right. So again, very very different. And I think mm. this is, you know, just to help sort of fuel your love of travel and and I just think if you can be a holiday rep you can do absolutely anything I was hire anybody who'd been a holiday rep hands right. down hands really down. because of you everything you've just, got to do basically everything you've got to do you just got to figure it out I mean this is the days before we had mobile phones the mm. the, the flack that you take from the public is yeah. just crazy yeah um you know the the complaints that you had were were just ridiculous i mean the, mm. the situations you deal with you know people dying like the worst thing is you know we had we had a guy die on the beach and we just didn't know who this guy was and then it turned out he was one of my guests and then you've got to figure out through the spanish authorities how to repatriate this guy and uh, his wife who's obviously distraught because you know it the situations that you come across are just so crazy yeah but you just have to fit you just have to figure out a way to do it yeah ah uh, it's thinking on your feet it's being you know unflappable keeping your cool keeping calm under pressure all of those yeah. things i can well imagine yeah and keeping a smile on your face and being completely resilient because we have you know like mm. we have air, airport transfers so we'd have to go on the bus with clients Yes. invariably the flights would be delayed most of them yeah. were at night so we'd do a day's work get on the transfer bus go to the airport the flight would be i don't know two three hours delayed now if yeah. you've got a three hour delayed flight from glasgow no offense to any glaswegians listening those people arrive completely drunk and you're oh. trying to manage them and you and it, You've, you've you've now been hanging around for three hours and you've got to go to work in about four hours so by the time you get back to your back to your resort it's like there's not much point in going to bed <laughs> just it's carry on it's crazy oh, it's like herding it's fun. cats as well yeah 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 and, then, and oh. something happens we used to joke something used to happen to people as they as they went through that metal detector at the airport as you go through that metal detector they almost lose all sense of common sense <laughs> oh right and they just revert to you as the holiday rep it's just like what would you do here at home <laughs> <laughs> figure it out what are you asking me for <laughs> <laughs> oh god okay so did that for a few years yeah so i did that for three seasons so it's a, a two summer a winter and a summer so it, it got okay. to about october 
And I just thought, I can't do this forever because it's so physically, I mean, you're out drinking. <laughs> like when you, you work hard and you play hard, it's the ultimate right. work hard, play hard. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was just at the end of the season, the reps are just exhausted yeah. mentally, physically, emotionally, and just need a rest. So again, I kind of came came back went back to the Isle of Wight I was still with I don't know how I was still was with that guy <laughs> I went back to the Isle of Wight and I started like right now I'm gonna look for a proper job um and I started working I, I was doing lots of like bar jobs and chilling out and I had a few trips and stuff but I started working for British Airways so I finally it's that thing of you start applying for all these jobs and then two offers come in at once and I had one offer from Sainsbury's on their graduate program and one offer from British Airways now I looked at it because of where I was living Sainsbury's placed me in their southwest region in Plymouth now, right. I didn't know where Plymouth was if anyone that knows the UK Plymouth is a town on the southwest and I looked at the map, like proper physical map, and I kind of went, there's no motorway there. <laughs> there's no motorway that gets there. And it just felt like such a, a, a place that was so far away. Yeah. And I was like, nah. I was like, it's an hour to Heathrow from once I got to the mainland. It's an hour to Heathrow. The pay was a bit better. It's a bit more exciting. I, I get to travel the world, so I'm going to go and join British Airways. So that's when I went to join British Airways. Yeah. And I ended up staying there for just under 20 years. Wow. Which I say that out loud and especially young people nowadays, they go like, what? <laughs> that was the thought I had when people used to say that to me. I've been here for 20 years. Um, but also because it's such a huge organization, you can do so many different roles and you can work in so many different yeah. parts of the business. Yeah. And I gravitated um, pretty much towards the HR learning leadership right. development kind of area so I started in cargo and basically I was playing this big game of Tetris and my job was to figure out here's a list of the cargo to get on this plane here's the space available figure out what can go based on priority yeah. lists and customers and stuff so that, that taught me so much about airplanes which really helped me when I got into like certain areas of the business so like right. when I was in engineering I could talk their language because I knew about which hold you can put certain things in and different types of aircraft and cargo bins and all of this kind of stuff so it yes. kind of it brought it it enabled me to kind of walk in there not just being an HR person but being an airline person which was yes which was really helpful to me yeah yeah brilliant and so what what so how long were you on like the graduate program before you then went into like, you know, the learning HR route kind of settled into that sector? Yeah. So I was, I was there for, I think it was like about 18 months, something like that, okay. two years. And then, and then I sort of moved out of it. I was actually on a training course. So we were, it was one of those what we call the sheep dip training where you're we're moving buildings so we're moving from this kind of old building into this state-of-the-art facility and I was chatting with the trainers at the break time and they were like oh you'd be brilliant in training oh and we've got a vacancy and I was like oh great I'll apply they went yeah it closes tonight so like go home and write your CV so I literally went home wrote my CV and submitted it <laughs> And then I got the job and it's, wow. and it was, it was brilliant. I mean, I just, you know, I was training, I was away every couple of weeks to some far flung destination because, you know, right. we'd, we used to, you know, I'd fly into like Miami and then we'd have uh, lots of the people coming up from sort of South America and, or we'd be in LA and we'd have all the people coming from the West coast. And then I'd be in Joburg yeah. and Hong Kong and Dubai. And so it was, it was, just a great time it was a really brilliant time because I was literally every couple of weeks I was hopping on an airplane going and delivering training and I usually extended my stay a little bit as well so I could see yes. a bit of the world <laughs> like why not my tickets paid for all I've got to do is pay for a night in a hotel and my food and that's fine yeah, you know? yeah. absolutely <laughs> otherwise you miss where you've been basically haven't you 
Plus, yeah. and because I was training in cargo, so I was part of, still part of the cargo team. Yeah. Most of my training was at in the cargo facility. So it's right. <laughs> so, so they put me up in a hotel like near there, and so it's not exactly like oh, you go to Miami and you're on South Beach. It's like no, no. I'm at Miami. I'm at the airport. So <laughs> I I was like. If I'm going to Miami, I'm gonna ha- I'm gonna tag on some days to see my see Miami, not just the airport. Just get and and yeah. there's, you know and there's a lone female traveling. You know there is a sort of say you can't you can't go out in some places. You know in Johannesburg no. I couldn't go out on my own at night, even no. to the mall. You know it was mm. like I had to get a taxi somewhere, or it's like no, don't go out after dark, literally. So yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite a shock sometimes. So yeah, it's 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 different. But it that gave me a great, you know, sense of traveling. And of and yeah. of course, having access to to flights meant that, you know, I can you know I could go and meet my the friends that I'd met in Paris who are now doing something else as well, and they're yes. going to be in LA for a week. I'm like, oh, I'll hop on a, I'll hop on a plane and I'll come I'll come to LA. There's there's a a French word for it. it's called ami values, which means suitcase friend. So it's so <laughs> my friend. <laughs> my friend was working. He used to go to California a lot, and uh, so I'd be his ami values, you know. And I was just like, oh hi, can I just come and stay in your hotel room? <laughs> He'd be working all day, and then I'd just you know chill like the full day <laughs> out at night. So it's good. Oh gosh, so that was quite an enjoyable ride then all of that for you on the training side did you do then any other things in HR so I moved into more of the what we call like HR business partner so I'm never I'm never the HR person that's the kind of tissues and sympathy and employment policies person that's not my strength my Mm. strength is the being that strategic business partner so um, working with my what we call my client areas so I was in Gatwick for quite a while and we worked on some of the big change programs there so essentially I'm a HR person that's working with the business so yes the challenge at Gatwick is we've got this what we'd call a legacy airline competing against these new guys on the block you know the easy jets the Ryanairs who have a very low cost base because they've yeah. designed their operation based on cost they sell based on cost and how do we compete with that So a lot of the stuff that we were working on was actually how do we reduce our cost base, which is Mm. some is is people, some is technology. But when you bring in technology, that impacts the people. So it's just working with the business on how do we kind of turn the business around. And we did actually. So before COVID, you know, we the, the question that we were tackling was we need to replace the short haul fleet of aircraft. How do we do that? We need to convince the board that that Gatwick is the place to be, and we completely changed the business model, got the new f- the funding for the new aircraft, and increased the long haul routes as well. So we did really turn the, the business around. So that's the HR side that I'm much more passionate about. That's more my right. zone of genius rather than the oh, you know, Jane was sick three times this week. What policy do we enact? It's like, oh my God, please don't ask me that question. I don't even know. Yeah. You know, or, oh, they didn't get paid this week. Can you look at that? No, I can't go to that person. Over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't like the look of this person anymore. How do we get them out of the business? Yeah. Yeah, there was a little bit of that on my side, but <laughs> it was. But, but, but it, you know, it's interesting. There's always casualties with anything like that, with any big change that there's, you know, if there's going to be a reduction mm. in headcount of, you know, in Gatwick, it was sort of in the region of five, 600 people, then you have yeah. to change the management structure around that because you don't need as many managers. So there is head, heads will go. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, I think what I do now is it's much more about how do you exit people from the business with yes. dignity and grace, because one of the things that we used to say to ourselves in that scenario was what we're doing to people may not be the, the, the nicest thing. So we're actually telling people that their livelihood is disappearing. Yes. Some people are, are at an age where they don't care because they're about to draw their pension. Yeah. But other, other people, they've still got a lot of time left in their working lives. The, the question is, we have to exit them because that's business. 
there's a way that we can do that though and there's a way the way mm. is with dignity and with grace and actually with speed because I mean you know I, it actually happened to me and I, it's quite funny because I, I moved out of that that sort of HR role into what we call a talent role so I was head of talent for a while but that was my last job in BA yes and having worked running all of these redundancy programs I knew at some point that that guillotine would fall on my neck and it did it, it did in uh, 2017 so yeah. I you know I, I ended up having that conversation with you know here's the new we got the presentation you know here's what the new organization looks like and you're like I can't see my role on there <laughs> you're like I know what's coming next you know, I've written the script what's yes. in it has it changed <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had that conversation with my boss and I looked around at the other roles that were available and I just thought either I've done them or I have no interest in them yeah. and you know I'm at, I was sort of 40 coming into my late 40s at the time thinking if I don't go now I'm going to be that person who's five ten years older who's going to be really pissed off that I've now got this news yeah. And what I can do is I can leave now with my head held high, having had a great time. Yes. Having still more in the tank. So that's what we used to talk about in talent. It's like, I've still got more in the tank. It's not over. Yeah. It's time that I take everything that I've learned and go somewhere else. So I left um, British Airways through redundancy after it, it was like six months short of 20 years. Mm. and I got I was think I was planning to have some time off I thought I'm gonna travel I'm gonna take some time off it's been really stressful yeah. but I yeah. got headhunted pretty much straight away um, so I went to start working in Leon so this is almost like full circle back to my yeah. to sort of hospitality roots so yeah. Leon is a fast food restaurant chain in I the UK. know them very well they're Yay. one of my favorite restaurants yeah. But do you know people either know them and just your reaction there, love yeah. them, or have never heard of them? They when I was working there, they were quite London centric, but now they yes. have had this exponential growth, which is fantastic. Uh, but I was their first head of training. So oh, gosh, it was fantastic. I mean, I just loved the culture, I loved everything that they stood for. I they're so way ahead of their time. And yeah. I'd gone from working for this huge big we used to call it a super tanker because you change direction yeah. it takes like ages for the ship to turn around whereas in Leon yeah. you just get an, an email from the the CEO who had created it as well so yes. that was a whole different spin yeah um, going this is what we're doing now make it happen and you're just like shit okay <laughs> <laughs> it was just completely different but it was it, it's the energy was incredible the energy mm. was infectious. You know, I think I was one of the oldest people there. So I'd, I'd started at BA as one of the youngest. And, yes. I, and I went to Leon as one of the oldest, which was, uh, which was a real, which is it's great because it, it means yeah. you're just surrounded by different types of people. You're just surrounded by this different energy and you're just learning different things. It's like yeah. this kind of reverse mentoring. Um, but that role, so it's interesting, everything that's been in the newspapers quite recently with the takeover, et cetera, that was that was being planned when I was there, obviously. Um, oh, it, I haven't heard that news. No. Oh, so they've, uh, they're now part of the Asda group. So, oh um, my God. Yeah. So it was, so, so I actually had an initial meeting with them about the first drive through Leon and it's now happens. So it's, it's really crazy that you can see. Where is things. it? It's in, somewhere up north when I had the meeting it was going to be Blackburn and it's not too far from there but they're oh, okay. all over um, motorway services now and it's great actually because when I travel now and I see a Leon it's like oh thank god I don't have to have a Big Mac <laughs> I know they're brilliant I mean it was my uh, niece who introduced me to her I went to meet her in London once and she said oh we'll go and meet in Leon I went what so I went in there was Carnaby Street and a very small one. Yeah. Um, and the first one yeah, that was. The first one. I fell in love yeah. with it then. Yeah. So if my wife and I are traveling or whatever, we hope there is one at the airport. Um, there was once we went, I can't remember which airport it was. It must have been Birmingham. 
I think I'm not sure, but we we couldn't get to one because it was whatever you call it, air side or oh yeah, it was, it was on the wrong side. <laughs> and we were walking through this building searching for it. We went, oh, we can't get to it because it's on the other side. Um, because we were like, we didn't want to eat all the other fast food. We wanted we wanted their fast food, healthy fast food. Yeah, brilliant. So how yes. long were you with them? So I was with them for eight months and then that was a really different experience in terms of mm. predominancy. So literally I got, I was working at home that day. I remember it very, very clearly. Yeah. And I was just about to, I went into my emails to, to, cause I was sending an email with an agenda for my first team meeting. So I'd suddenly, we'd finally got to the point where, you know, these people were joining my team. These people were joining my team. We yeah. had something in the diary you know like the first session what are we all about what do we want to be known for all of that kind of stuff yeah and there was a message from my boss and I opened it and they opened the pdf signed letter that was written in a completely different language than is usual it was very yeah. formal but I was like this is this is an, a meet this is an invitation to a meeting to discuss my future employment now <laughs> right right I knew what this meant this meant I yeah. have no future employment so literally the next day I went in and it was your last day's Monday go home write a handover come back with your laptop mobile phone keys to the office and a handover and that's it you're finished oh, which so. was uh, well that was a couple of weeks before Christmas so oh, Merry Christmas oh, when people do <laughs> They always do it leading up to Christmas. Uh, do you know? I, you know, I, I've been involved in a lot of redundancies. I don't think there's a good time. I, and I actually I know. think the time, the time is now. If you know it's going to happen, then Jane, I've been a manager for many years, and I've made loads of people redundant, and I hated every minute of it. I mean, actually, for so lots of people, it was good news. For lots of people, yeah. it was. They've been waiting for it. The worst one was, was in my last employment job where the MD had been, had been considering these people for about five years to make them redundant. I joined and after two weeks, he told me, you got to make these people redundant. I'm like, you got to be kidding. No, you got to <laughs> sack them. I said, on what basis? You know, I didn't even see what they were capable of. I mean, yeah, you're right. There's never a good time, but Christmas, no. yeah, that's bad. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, it is what it is. And, it, and it's interesting because I talk a lot about this in my work. And I say, actually, this is the, we talk a lot about the change curve with redundancy. And yeah. I say, yes and no. I said, so the change curve, yes, but change is something that happens to you. So, so redundancy is a great example, whereas it's happened to me. There's nothing I can do about it now. And I will go through a change curve, but actually what I need to focus on is the transition. So what I need yeah. to focus on is how do I transition out of this situation that I'm in that has been mm. imposed upon me and come through the other side. So there's, there's, there's a different model that I like to use in my clients, which is called the transition model by William Bridges and he talks about the endings you know letting go and then the the middle yeah. stage and then the final stage is new beginnings and actually it's about yeah. how do you focus on you know the the change will happen almost immediately so with that redundancy at Leon it was you know four days you know four you know four days from getting the letter to leaving the transition took months because I it was before Christmas I had a couple of trips in um I took some time off. I I have a friend who's who I worked at Disney with, whose crew, and I travelled a bit with him on his trips. And then I I was thinking about starting my own business, and it was almost this like itch that I thought I need to scratch. Yeah. So I just thought, what's what's the worst that can happen? Right. Mm. What is the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> that ultimately. So why am I dithering about? Because what I was doing was I was applying for jobs and thinking about setting up a business at the same time. Yes. And what I figured is I was doing neither of them very well because I wasn't yeah. 100% in on one of them. So it's, it's almost, again, it's like if I was, you know, I did a lot of coaching of myself. It's like if I was coaching myself, what would I say? And it's almost like 
it, it's and, and I think this is a metaphor for life, isn't it? When you're trying to do two things well, you're doing neither of them well. So it's almost like stick with one thing and just go all in. And I, um, yeah. I had a bit of an epiphany moment when we were in Hong Kong. And there was just, it was almost like I was waiting for a sign and I got the sign and I was like, no, this is it. I need to go and do this business thing. I need to stop messing about with trying yeah. to find a job that I don't really want. I mean, you, when you yeah. start to look for a job and you see all these job descriptions and you're like, they all say the same thing. It doesn't really mean anything. And I know this is like a utopia, but you get in there and it's not, it's not how it's you know, never presented in the outside world it's like why do I want to do that it's yes. like I'm sick of working for idiots I want to work for <laughs> myself I want to choose who I work with and that's yeah. what I love about my job right now I choose who I work with I I coach for an organization and they it's almost like you know they have to have a, a book that people can flick through and they choose three coaches have a conversation and then pick yes. the coach that works for them she's brilliant um, I had one of these conversations the other day with someone and then it kept, then I reflected on this. I thought, I, I'm not sure this, me and this person are going to get on. I'm not sure about it. And that to me says a lot. If I'm thinking about the, the conversation we've had and yeah. the, the, the person who organizes it in, in this organization actually messaged me and says, Oh, you know, this person um, has chosen another coach on this occasion. <laughs> And I just went back and I went, that's the best decision. I said, because yeah. I've been really reflecting on it and I don't think I would be the right coach for that person. Mm. And she said, oh, that's interesting. And I went, well, this is why we have a chemistry chat. I said, so I, it's not just about the client, your no. employee. I said, choosing who they want to be their coach. It's also about the coach saying yes or no. Yeah, I've interesting. Kind of isn't it? forgotten that because it's yeah. not about, I'm going to bow down and just work for you because I'm on your books. No, it's coaching is about chemistry. If there's not that yeah. chemistry there, which is why it's called a chemistry chat. <laughs> there's not the <laughs> chemistry there. It's not going to work. And there's, and there's no way. I, and I kept thinking about it, thinking, I don't think I could work with this person. Mm. So, so then, then the organization was making a bad investment. If he wanted to work with me and, and that's the beauty about running your own business is you can choose who you work with. It's yeah. the best thing about it. Yeah. And, you know, just to add to that, I mean, my wife is a coach and we've often had this chat. I mean, she does the same with her clients. They have a chat to begin with, you know, before she gives them the opportunity to choose, basically. And yeah. she said, I might not be the right person for you. So and yeah. you might not be the right person for me either. Yeah. And the other thing we've discovered, we we like doing yoga and she we we both have discovered that you're it's with any kind of training even with yoga training you've got to have a connection with your yoga teacher even and go yeah. how what's the vibe like with this person yeah. you know do you want to be taught by this person how to do yoga or or can't you stand them you know you you don't <laughs> agree with the ethos or how they're training yoga and even from that level or you know having a personal trainer in the gym yeah. it's the same thing yeah incredible it's, and it's and it can be so intangible I mean I think in this particular situation there was something where there was a couple of things that the individual said where I just thought this this ooh, like red flags <laughs> <laughs> like yes. red flags warning signs and, I, and then I thought well maybe and I was like no actually I, I've that's triggering a lot of stuff in me um right you know and and very different views very it's based on their experience and that's fine yeah um, yeah but it, yeah but if the chemistry is not there if trust is not there mm. then mm. it's 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 just not going to work no it's really yeah. not going to work no okay so Tell us then, what, what are the facets of your business today? And what made you decide this is what I want to do for my business? So it's funny because when I started my business, the thing that really confused me is, well, what am I going to do? Because I was coaching already at BA. So we had right. an internal coaching course where I did my qualifications with Ashridge yes. and was one of the, the people internally. Yes. And people could come to me with a whole host of issues that you should be nominated by their manager. And then I started my business and I was like, well, I can do this and I can do that. I can help people with mm. their people strategy and I can do career coaching and I can do uh, 
next level coaching or I could just do you know like mentoring I could so many things I could do and actually it's like fo- it's it's like that thing isn't it it's like focus on the one thing so one thing at one time yeah but you don't have to marry it <laughs> it's like yes just pick one thing so I so I've I've um I started out with um, helping people who just um, experience redundancy so that right. was so thinking about all of the stuff that I've had to mm. general career coaching to helping HR directors write their people strategy to um, helping people to kind of take the next step to first 90 day coaching so I've tried all of those things and I've loved all of those things all of those things but where yeah. I've actually got to is that now I focus on the outplacement so I work it's generally HR directors who come to me right? because they need to exit somebody from their business yes. and they want to do it quickly with, with dignity and with grace. Now, sometimes yes. it's through redundancy. So they can't put their senior leader on the same workshops as the people they've just been managing. Yes. Do that. Um, uh, that or it, or it's just a, um, they're just not a good fit for the organization. So they've been no. hired by the organization and they just don't fit. And it, and it's not a blame game. It's, it's actually, let's do the kind thing and let's just rip the plaster off and cut the cord and let's help you to make your next transition. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so I work with HR directors and they put their people in front of me. And yeah. they're generally senior people that you. Yeah. So so when, yeah. you know, if, if you're doing a big you know, redundancy program, you, you might engage an organization who will do sort of group sessions with people around CV because very often people haven't written the CV for years. No, it's really awkward to put your senior people in that group. It's yes. awkward for everybody <laughs> yes. because actually there's a lot, you know, people talk about their vulnerabilities, their concerns. Mm. We don't just go to the CV. We, we actually start with actually what's your value? How are you feeling right now? Are you pissed off? Yeah. Are you secretly quite happy? Those senior leaders can't say that stuff in a group of people no. that they were, were managing like no. three days before. So it's that safe space for the leader to go, actually, uh, this is, I'm really pissed off or I'm secretly quite happy or I don't really want a job. I'm actually cruising to retirement. And it's like, well, that's okay. Should we talk about that for you? What, how do you, again, that transition, how do you transition yeah. out of this working role into retirement? What do you want your life to look like? Um, or it can be, you know, some people are like, I want to kind of set up on my own. I want to, I don't want to be a, a wage slave. I want to work a few you know, a few months of the year, I want to have August off, I want to have Christmas off, I want to have just enough to, to come in. So again, we will then focus on, so what do you need to do to make that happen? Yeah. And sometimes yeah. it's about, I, I'd like another job. So it's like, okay, so so who for, whereabouts? Yeah. What, yeah. You know, is it a country move? Is it a location move? Is it doing the same thing? Is it going back to something you were doing 20 years ago so we explore all of that and then think about how yeah. do we position that person in, in the marketplace oh great so it's the whole kind of helping them with their cv looking at how it's written um even to the point uh, let's say what about the <clears throat> you know locating the jobs or applying do you get involved in that part as well or yes so so senior jobs the, mm. or the job market let's say is like an iceberg so you only see the top third that's right and the more the more senior you go the 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 smaller the iceberg that you see because very often yeah. um people just don't advertise them so in ba i would be recruiting people i would be in the marketplace looking for people because i knew that we were going to fire someone yeah <laughs> That sounds terrible. So I so there was some there was there was a couple of occasions where my boss didn't even know about what I was doing. It was me and the mm. CEO working together to yeah. locate some people. Yeah. Um, so so I know that that's happening, and in in the background. Um, also, yeah. people just don't necessarily want to 
when they put jobs into the marketplace, they kind of scare the horses a little bit. And they're like, oh, what's that job? Because it always comes back to an organization somehow. Whereas yeah. if you're if you're kind of on a one-on-one through a headhunter or just through your networks, it it that's how jobs happen. It's it's I rare know. that as a senior leader you will apply for a job. You might be asked to submit an application or submit a CV, but but yeah. it won't be on, it's highly unlikely that the job is going to be on a job board somewhere you're, yeah you're much more likely to be approached so it's about how do you get your message out there yeah so you're now yeah. a product and and you need to think of yourself as the marketing team marketing you so it's back to that yeah who's going to buy you what type of organization what do you bring how are you going to make the money save the mm-hmm. money mitigate mm-hmm. any risk and you, and you need to be talking numbers so a lot of that stuff that we do with them is like okay you say you're just doing your job we need to unpick that a little bit more (laughs) like like so let's talk what was the result of that what went wrong what went what went well you know Mm. and you really need to think about and the result was so what did that mean in terms of Mm. you know increased Mm. sales increased employee engagement you know reduction in sickness levels increased retention you know yeah you need to start really thinking about it in business terms Mm. Absolutely. Oh, it's it's how's it going, first of all? How long have you been doing it and how's it going? So 2022 is gonna be my fourth year Great. doing it. So it's um it's going quite well actually. I've um I've had some time off. Um so I know we talked about when we were trying to arrange this, so I was overseas. Mm. Um having not been able to travel for two years that was very yes. frustrating for you um, especially <laughs> for me oh my god yeah and, and also my husband my husband is um is Mauritian so we haven't seen his family for a, a long time and we're getting to that yeah. age where our parents are aging so you know yes. my mum was in hospital for a few weeks and oh. his dad's not been well so so I've been you know again sort of focusing away from the business and focusing on that stuff but it's right it's i'm i'm back all of that is as fixed as it can be for the moment and yeah back back with a vengeance so yeah i mean i mean i i i only work with two clients maximum at any one time just because it's a again part of my learning has been uh, i'd rather work with fewer people but give them much higher quality yeah uh, focus you know, and they can contact me, you know, my VIP clients can contact me anytime between 10 and four via yeah. Voxer. So if they've got a question or something comes up, they can contact mm. me, you know, and, and I can't do that. I can't provide that if I'm working with lots of people at one time. Yeah. So are you looking for introductions? Are you kind of going, no, I'm okay. I'll find my own ones only because I, I know one person in particular that I can put you in touch with. Um, we can chat about that after the official interview is over. <laughs> but um, and also, I used to be in. Let's put it this way: I used to want to be connected on LinkedIn to HR professionals, HR directors, because yeah. I had a product that they may be interested in, which was me to begin with. But then later on, it was a training product. Um, So I had lots of, you know, so my network on LinkedIn is is quite big on that front. So feel free to have a look through. I might not know them all, I have to say, because I've got a big network. (laughs) Um, But um, feel free to have a look through. Actually, you might not even be able to. Uh, But if you see somebody that I'm connected to, let me know. I'm anybody who's listening to this podcast Fantastic. i'm very happy i mean linkedin is like it's such a game changer isn't it for how how we kind of connect with people you know yeah. most of my business actually comes from linkedin so brilliant you know it, it's yeah. i'm very active on that if anybody listening wants to connect with me on linkedin you know please do um i accept everybody apart from the weird blokes who you can just tell yeah. they spam you <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah no I, I i most of my clients buy me through linkedin and, and i'm much more of the you know i i'm i go live on there a couple of times a week i'm posting a lot of content and i actually get really nice 
messages from people who go, I know I've never worked with you. I've never paid to work with you, but I follow you. And I think yeah. I've used your advice and I've just brilliant. handed in my resignation. I got one of those the other day. And it's just <laughs> brilliant. It's like I've, I've resigned from I've left X company. Um, I can't tell you where I'm going yet, but I you'll see it. Um, but I've just been input. I've just been following your advice. <laughs> so it's just like, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. So what you need to do for those ones, a tiny bit of advice for anybody who gives free advice, send up, set up a um, account with buy me a coffee. Uh, do you know, I, I have been thinking about this because I keep yes. seeing it on YouTube and I was like, and I always do. I for those creators who I just subscribe to, and I just think, yeah, I'll buy you coffee, ten quid. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that is a great idea. I am yeah, going to yeah. do that. Now, for twenty twenty two, anybody who gets you free advice, say, well, I hope it was useful. Feel free to buy me a coffee, <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many coffees some people buy you. Yeah, uh, yeah, as well. So I've been pleasantly surprised with it as yeah. well. So it's interesting because oh, I always, I was always taught like if there's a busker who makes you stop, yes, always give a. It was like give them a dollar. That's it's a long time ago, but you know, or yeah. you know, a, a euro, a pound, whatever. It's like if a busker makes me stop and watch, yeah, I always give them something. Ah, oh, good. Yeah. Soul. that's yeah Pay it I, forward. I agree with you yeah 100 it forward 100 percent jane I've, what have we missed is there anything i haven't <laughs> asked or got out of you so um i'll ask you in a second to to share where people can find you but in in summation you kind of support people with their next career move uh through whatever means they've been asked to make the next career move <laughs> And you literally help them with the nuts and bolts and everything, including the, the practical side, but the psychological side as well. Is that about right? Or Yeah, I'd say we, you know, let's we don't jump straight to the CV to, to write the best CV mm. or LinkedIn profile. You've actually got to hit the pause button and take four steps back. And just go, right. Well, yeah. what, do you, you know, what do you want to be today? You know, because yeah. you can be anything you want, you, anything you want to be. You can be right mm. now. You just got to figure out how you position yourself as the go-to person for that thing and yes. then what I help my clients do is just you know sort of tease out all that stuff from them that says actually yeah you can do that thing mm. you can be that that thing that you want to be um, yeah so yeah and and you know support them through that process because it's it's a roller coaster finding a job if there's yeah. there are the highest highs and the lowest lows and it's it's a roller coaster mm. ride it is yeah it is I mean <sighs> It's an interesting market at the moment, isn't it? There, you you can't quite. I mean, I'm not looking for a job, but you can't quite believe the kind of headlines necessarily that says you know there's millions of jobs available and they're struggling to. It's like a job hunters market at the moment or employee market. You know, you can demand yeah. whatever you want to demand type of thing. Uh, but I guess the more senior you get. It, it gets tougher it's a tougher market to to get placed in as well there, there are f just fewer jobs you know so yeah. it's just maths <laughs> so you know there's there's mm. talk about you know you know a couple of restaurants we go in it's like they they've started to close on certain days just because they can't ha they haven't got the staff they can't they can't keep the staff for some reason no. they can't get them they can't keep them at a mm. senior level there are just fewer jobs so yeah the, but what I say to my clients is you need to be really clear about what it is you want, what type of organization and what you can bring and then start to work your network because you're, if you're really clear with your network, then they can work their networks for them. And then your, it, it, your opportunity explodes, but be yeah. clear. So don't, so I see these people on LinkedIn and I want to comment because they go, oh, hi, just want to let you know, I'm in the marketplace for a new job. If you see anything, let me know. It's like, that's just like the vaguest thing ever, right? Yeah, yeah. What do you, where, what are you looking for? Where do you want? Da, da, da. Like be memorable in my mind, you know, and even, yeah. you know, some clever people, some, some of my clients have felt comfortable. They've kind of put together, uh, you know, a, not even a one page email with the, this is, this is 
this is my strength. This is what I'm looking for. This is the region. This is the types of organizations. And they've sent that to their network. So when their network hears of something, they go, oh, I got an email from Michael about that. Hang on, let me just go and find it. Oh, my, Mike, would this guy suit you? And, and so your network does your job hunting for you. That's it's it such happens. a good point because exactly the same happens at networking events. I've been, you know, I haven't been to many in the last couple of years, but <laughs> before that, I was a serial kind of networker going to business networking events. And the majority of people that you speak to, they go, hi, what do you do? And they're going to go, oh, well, I'm a graphic designer and I live there, you know, and I have to tease it out of them. So what's your strength, you know, or <laughs> who do you want and what kind of work do you want? You know, what's your yeah. ideal client? And people often haven't got that on the tip of their tongue. They have, haven't got a clue, yeah. um, which is why, yeah, it's a struggle sometimes. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I hope lots of people who are listening will spread that message around for you and, yeah, have a good think about where they want to go for their next uh, for their next gig. Next job. You can be anything you want to be. <laughs> you can be anything you want to be. I love that. I love that. Jane, where can people connect with you? So LinkedIn more is, about, my, yeah. is my social media of choice. So Jane yes. Ferre is just my name on there. Or head on over to my website, which is janeferre.com. That's very easy. Uh, I'll make sure to include those in the show notes. It's been really fabulous talking to you. And wh where do you live now in the country? So right now I am in Staines upon Thames. So just oh. west of London, not far from Heathrow still. So. Not far from Heathrow. They're yeah. probably flying <laughs> over your house as we <laughs> But obviously the beauty of, you know, everybody being very comfortable on Zoom now is, you know, I've got clients in Hong Kong, South Africa, Paris, Brilliant. you know. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. You can literally. Yeah. As long as the time zone works, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> That's sometimes a challenge for people to know. Yeah. yeah. I've had I've had people book on this podcast where they've booked for like 1.30 in the morning not realizing I was on a different time. Zone. <laughs> so that's, that's been interesting as well. Jane, lovely to chat with you. Thank you so much for sharing your story and everything you're up to. Wish you massive success for 2022 and um, hope to speak to you soon. Keep in touch. Brilliant. Thanks for having me, Michael. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.